Today I'm going to be reading Ethnic Hash by Patricia J. Williams. I'm going to read the paragraphs out loud and then provide time for you to write your own annotations. Let's begin. Recently I was invited to a book party. The book was about diversity. Bring an appetizer representing your ethnic heritage, said the hostess, innocently enough. Her request threw me into a panic. Do I even have an ethnicity? I wondered. It was like suddenly discovering you might not have a belly button. I tell you, I had to go to the dictionary. What were the flavors, accents, and the words that were passed down to me over the ages? What were the habits, customs, and common traits of the social group by which I have been guided in life? And how do I cook them? Go ahead and pause your video to write your own annotations. So here, as you can see, I highlighted the word appetizer. And an appetizer, I'm guessing from context clues, is a dish. Um, and I've gone ahead and done the first annotations for you. Here are my annotations. My main takeaway from this paragraph is that the author had to bring a cultural dish to a party, and this scared her. My connection, or my question, is why did she feel like she had to look in a dictionary to find out who she is? If you didn't come up with your own annotations, you can go ahead and copy down mine. I'm going to ask you to do your own annotations for the following paragraphs. Let's move on. My last name is from a Welsh plantation owner. My mother chose my first name from a dictionary of girls' names. It didn't sound like Edna or Myrtle, she said, as though that explains everything. I have two mostly Native American grandparents. There's a Scottish great-grandfather, a French-Canadian great-uncle, a bunch of other relations no one ever talks about. Not one of them left recipes. Of course, the ancestors who have had the most tangible influence it on my place in the world were probably West Africans, and I can tell you right off that I haven't the faintest idea what they do for appetizers in West Africa. Go ahead and pause and make your annotations. So you can see that I've highlighted the words Welsh. I went ahead and looked that up. That means someone who is from Wales, which is part of the United Kingdom, close to England. I also highlighted the word tangible. I looked that up and I found out that that means really concrete and clear. Finally, I highlighted the word faintest. I looked that up and found out that that means the most vague or basic idea. So now I'm going to move on to paragraph three. Ethnic recipes throw me into the same sort of quandary as that proposed interracial box on the census form. The concept seems so historically unclear, so cheerfully open-ended as to be virtually meaningless. As far as the world's concerned, I've always thought of myself as just plain black. Let's face it, however much my categories get jumbled, when I hang out at my favorite kosher sushi spot, it's the little black core of me that moves through the brave new world of Manhattan as I hail a cab, rent an apartment, and apply for a job. Go ahead and pause and make your annotations, your main takeaways, and your connections or questions. Paragraph four. Although it's true, I've never tried hailing a cab as an ethnic, so let me see. My father is from the state of Georgia. When he cooks, which is not often, the results are distinctly southern. His specialties are pork chops and pies. He makes the good luck black-eyed peas on New Year's. His, spe his recipes are definitely black in a regional sense, since most blacks in the United States until recently lived in the southeast. He loves pig. He uses lard. Go ahead and pause and make your annotations. Paragraph 5. My mother's family is also black, but relentlessly steeped 
in the New England tradition of hard winter cuisine. One of the earliest memories is of my mother borrowing my father's screwdriver so she could pry open a box of salt cod fish. In those days, cod came in wooden boxes, nailed shut, and you really had to hack around the edges to loosen the lid. Cod from a box had to be soaked overnight. The next day, you mixed it with boiled potatoes and fried it in Crisco. Then you served it with baked beans in a little brown pot with salt pork and molasses. There was usually some shredded cabbage as well with carrots for color. And of course, there was piccalilli. Every good homemaker had piccalilli on hand. Oh, and hot rolls served with homemade Concord grape jelly, or maybe just brown bread and butter. These were the staples of Saturday night supper. Pause the video and make your annotations. Paragraph six. We had baked chicken on Sundays, boiled chicken other days. My mother had recipes for how to boil a chicken, a whole range of them, with and without bay leaf, onion, potatoes, carrots. With boiled chicken, life can never be dull. Pause and make your annotations. Paragraph seven. The truth is, we liked watermelon in our family. But the only times we ate it, well, those were secret moments, private moments, guilty, even shameful moments, always worried by the thought of what might happen if our white neighbors saw us enjoying the primeval fruit. We were always on display when it came to things stereotypical. Fortunately, my mother was never handier in the kitchen than when under political pressure. She would take that odd, thin-necked implement known as a melon baller and gouge out innocent pink circlets and serve them to us like 104 mounds of faux sorbet in fluted crystal goblets. The only time we used those goblets was to disguise watermelon in case someone was looking secretively through the windows, lurking about in racial judgment. You can see here that I've highlighted quite a few words that I'm not sure about. You can go ahead and look up those words in a dictionary to make sure that you understand the overall meaning. Once you do, go ahead and write your main takeaways and your connections or questions, press pause now. Paragraph eight. I don't remember my parents having many dinner parties, but for those special occasions requiring actual appetizers, there were crackers and cream cheese, small sandwiches with the crust cut off, red devil deviled ham with mayonnaise and chopped pickles, and where there were appetizers, there had to be dessert on the other end to balance things out. Slices of homemade cake and punch. Will you take coffee or tea? My mother would ask shyly at the proud culmination of such a meal. Go ahead and pause and make your annotations. Paragraph nine. Some have said that too much salt cod early in life hobbles the culinary senses forever. I have faith that this is not the case and that any disadvantage can be overcome with time and a little help from William Sonoma. Having grown up and learned that you are what you eat, I have worked to broaden my horizons and cultivate my tastes. I entertain global cooking hopes and my palate knows no limits. After all, if Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben can just get over it, who am I to cling to the limitations of the past? Yes, I have learned to love my inner ethnic child. And so I leave you with a recipe for the 21st century. Go ahead and pause and make your annotations. Paragraph 10. Chicken with Spanish rice and not just black beans. Boil the chicken, boil the rice, boil the beans. Throw in as many exotic sounding spices and mysterious roots as you can lay your hands on. 
go on, use your imagination. And garnish with those fashionable little wedges of lime that make everything look vaguely Thai. Watch those taxis screech to a halt. A guaranteed crowd pleaser that can be reheated or rehashed generation after generation. Go ahead and pause, make your annotations. Once you're done annotating, write your one to two sentence summary of what you read. In Ethnic Hash, the author, Patricia Williams, explains how confusing her multiracial identity is. She uses food as evidence to explain this. Is a good one to two sentence summary. Go ahead and write your own.